As a generalization, Western and Central Asia are pretty dry places. Most of the exceptions to this rule are at high elevations, and even there it's often semi-arid. But just to the south of the Black and Caspian Seas, we can see a very drastic exception. Parts of these two regions can actually qualify as temperate rainforest. As a result, their ecology, culture, and history are radically different from the surrounding regions. But first, why do these lush exceptions exist? Oddly enough, one of the primary forces that dries Western and Central Asia also creates these pockets of rainforest. In summer, humid tropical air moves northward to bring monsoon showers to East and South Asia. But to compensate for all this tropical air moving northward, northerly winds move south across Western and Central Asia. This is a warm, very dry continental wind that gets drier as it moves south because the increasing temperature drops its relative humidity. For most of the region, this summer northerly wind is desiccating. In the Aegean, these winds were named the Etesians. In short, the monsoon of the Far East helps to create an anti-monsoon in the Near East. But when these dry northerly winds cross the Black and Caspian Seas in summer, they pick up significant moisture and deliver it to the southern shore. Mountain ranges lift the northerlies, cooling this humid air until it condenses into rain. And in winter, the relative warmth of these seas adds a tremendous amount of water vapor to any cold, dry air mass moving south. Winter northerly and westerly winds are particularly consistent over the Black Sea, resulting in steppe environments on the northern and eastern shores and rainforest covering much of the south and west. As a result, there's a north-to-south trend of decreasing rainfall, especially in summer. It's very similar to Spain, where summer northerlies water the north coast while most of the Iberian Peninsula is dry. The Bosporus is at an interesting transition zone as a result of these nearly year-round northerly winds. A temperate oceanic climate prevails on the north-facing slopes, while the south-facing slopes have a Mediterranean climate. The hills around this strait are just tall enough to cause a slight rain shadow. Ecologically, these two regions are very unique. In the Pontic forests, to the south of the Black Sea, we can find the Nordman fir, the tallest tree in all of Eurasia, excluding the tropical rainforests of the southeast. Through the cold and dry phases of the last glacial period, the Pontic region served as an ark, a sanctuary. Wedged between a giant lake and a mountain range, it was an island of humidity and moderate temperatures that saved many temperate species from extinction, allowing them to recolonize Europe when the climate began to warm again. The Hyrcanian forests to the south of the Caspian Sea were once home to the westernmost tiger population in all of Asia. Thanks to the thick forest cover, these tigers evaded human hunting for far longer than the lions of Iran and Anatolia. Trophy hunting in the 20th century and overhunting of their favorite prey, the wild boar, finally put an end to the Caspian tiger. But leopards and brown bears still call the Hyrcanian forest home. At its northern end, where the Caspian Sea is shallow and very fresh, the severe winters of the steppe freeze its surface. Caspian seals from around the sea travel north in winter to give birth on the secluded ice. The middle and southern reaches of the sea, on the other hand, are much deeper and more brackish, reaching over 3,000 feet deep or over 1,000 meters. Thanks to the high thermal capacity of this deep water, the southern coastal plain has mild winters that allow for the growth of oranges and sugarcane. Mandarins are also produced near the Black Sea, at about 40 degrees north in Georgia, about the same latitude as Philadelphia. The moderate climate is also ideal for tea production. Both regions are major tea producers and consumers. The staple grain in northern Iran for centuries has been rice, grown in the vast rice paddies of the Caspian coastal plain. Before the 1500s, rice was only a staple here, in the lush north. Elsewhere, it was food for the wealthy. Given such a rich environment, it's no surprise that these two regions could be encouraging to invasion. But their unusual geography has played a role in warfare, too. The Caspian Sea is unusual in that it's an enormous body of water, but it isn't connected to the broader ocean. Throughout recorded history, 
It's mostly been surrounded by steppe and desert nomads, except in the humid south and southwest. As a result, kingdoms and empires that have controlled the well-watered south have placed less emphasis on coastal defense and more emphasis on being invaded from the sides, where invaders would come by horse and camel rather than by boat. In fact, sometime in the Middle Ages, walls were constructed in the southeast and northwest, which would complete the natural mountain and water defenses against steppe invaders. But this left the rich, fertile shorelines vulnerable to rare occasions of raiding by ship. In the early Middle Ages, Vikings from the far north used the Volga River to enter the Caspian Sea and to raid the west and south. The Cossacks, who were basically river pirates, took the same route in the 1600s and pillaged the same shorelines. But smash-and-grab attacks have had far more success here than full-scale invasion. As most of you probably know, thick forests and mountains lend a strong home-field advantage to guerrilla fighters. In World War I, three different global powers invaded Persia to gain control of the oil reserves and strategic location. The British from the Persian Gulf, the Ottomans from the West, and the Russians from the North. These foreign influences, along with grievances against the central government, gave birth to the Jengali movement, or jungle movement, in northern Iran. The movement was headed by an enigmatic leader by the name of Mirza Kushik Khan, a strict nationalist who rallied local people to oppose their much more powerful invaders, as well as the central government in Tehran. The Jangalis used guerrilla tactics, melting back into the forest after each attack. Invading forces never gained complete control of the region, with supply lines being constantly weakened. Even the British only managed to hold on to Rasht for a couple years before being ousted by the Jangalis again. These guerrilla rebels were only defeated after the war when ideological divides within the group left them vulnerable to the forces of the central government. Geography also helped the Pontic region maintain a unique culture and identity for millennia. This region was home to the easternmost coastal colonies of ancient Greece, and this Greek influence lasted for thousands of years. Through much of the Middle Ages, the Greek-speaking empire of Trebizond persisted on these shores, despite repeated attacks from the south. To the south, various Turkish forces relied heavily on cavalry, which was less effective in forested and mountainous terrain, a factor which also helped Genoese colonies in Crimea hold back Mongol invasions for a while. The Pontic Greeks held on for centuries, but eventually Turkish forces consolidated the Black Sea coast. By the 20th century, the majority of Pontic Greek communities had been forced back to Greece, massacred, or converted to Islam, and assimilated. History in both of these regions has taken a winding and often dark path, but nonetheless, it has been unique and fascinating. Much more could be said, of course, but I hope this rough overview has been helpful to the Google Earth travelers among you who might have been curious about those enigmatic strips of green. Thanks for watching.